So this month we are starting up Soka Koji's friendship drive uh, the whole month of November, and I'll try to keep this short. I um, received the feedback last time that I was a bit long winded, which I've never been told before. So um, we are just going to try to bring you throughout the month different updates about the activities we're doing here at Soka Koji. So please keep an eye on your email. If you're not on our mailing list, you can join it um, at sokokoji.org. And we're also going to be letting you know about some of the um, financial needs we have to help us continue to offer our program and continue to grow. Um, something we're offering special this year is uh, oh, oh, a Soka Koji Buddhist Community Buddhist Temple Monastery mug with Soka Zan's personal chop mark on there um, for a donation. And you can find that on our website as well. So with that, I will hand it over, turn it over to Soka Zan and let you know that we will continue to make these brief announcements before Soka Zan's talk. So you're not going to want to miss them. Definitely don't join late and listen to all the things I have to say. This morning, I want to talk a little bit about shikantaza, which is a Japanese word for uh, just precisely this. It's a, a, <clears throat> a way of teaching mindfulness, awareness, meditation, all the other words that come under that. Uh, it's, a, it's very simple. It's probably the simplest because it is just about watching what moves. So you hold everything you can very still not particularly holding your mind still, but just holding everything you can still. If the mind becomes still, fine. If it gets active or rumbles around, and just observe that. So it's just very, very simple. Uh, the other form of practice that is, uh, is taught quite a bit, which I've done some of myself, um, is uh, called mindfulness, or the technical word would be satipatthana. Sati meaning Mindfulness, uh, patana, is, is several meanings for that, but the one that's commonly um, talked about is a foundation practice, or it's another word, I think, that's a, it's a Pali word also means presence. Interpret them uh, differently, and we'll, as we know, people get confused over conceptual references to uh, particular meanings and directions so on. So I'm not, um, I teach uh, Shikantaza because that's to me, and this is pretty um, individual, but to me, it looks like that's the best approach to take to, uh, for a beginning meditator and uh, an advanced meditator, so to speak. Someone who's been meditating for 30, 40 years is advanced. Someone who's been med meditating eight or 10 years is, thinks they're advanced. Uh, and they may be, they may be advanced. Or the, the whole idea of advanced and not advanced may come into play at some point. One may get a deeper understanding of what it means to uh, be ahead of the game, which is more of a materialistic approach to it. So uh, since my memory is uh, uh, full of a lot of useless junk, um, I have some notes here. Four foundations of mindfulness in the traditional sense that is, uh, that is in the Majjhima Nikaya and the uh, Digha Nikaya, the early teachings of the Buddha. Uh, he talks about uh, this in four different categories, mindfulness of mind, mindfulness of feelings, mindful, or mindfulness of body, excuse me, that's why I need the card, uh, mindfulness of body, mindfulness of feelings, mindfulness of mind, and mindfulness of dharmas. And my teacher, my first teacher, Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche, in the early seminary, uh, seminary talks that he gave at uh, different places, first one is in 1973, and uh, he changed some of those, and... Uh, but also I would like to say, um, my understanding is, I, I didn't know this until I read it somewhere, um, that, that he, um, that uh, um, this uh, mindfulness, the four foundations of mindfulness is not something that's particularly taught in the Tibetan Buddhist uh, lineages and so on. It's not ignored either, but it's not emphasized. Usually there's 
some kind of puja practice or some kind of um, um, mantra practice or something like that is taught for uh, beginning practitioners. So the four foundations, the way he, uh, Trung Rinpoche, changed those were from mindfulness of body. He kept that one, mindfulness of body. And then feelings, he put in the word livelihood or just being alive with a sense of being alive. And then the mind was mindfulness of effort, which he was a uh, flash of awareness that brings you back into, you've been out uh, planting your garden, making plans to go to New Jersey or something like that. And then there's, then there's a flash of, of just this. And, and that's the effort he was talking about. Effort is not in the conventional sense of pushing on something, pulling on something, trying to get something to be different. It's just a fundamental openness that opens up to the energy, opens up to the energy that doesn't belong to anybody. There's no ownership. So mindfulness of effort, and then mindfulness of dharmas, which is the the Theravadan and probably the Sarvastivadan approach to uh, um, satipatthana or uh, establishing mindfulness. Uh, would be uh, he changed that to mind or mental objects. Uh, um, I'm not sure how he delineated, delineated all that, but I possibly I could respond to some questions if he had some about that. And so uh, that's laying out uh, Satipatthana, which is taught, and quite often it's taught with eyes closed so that you can be more concentrated. Um, Zen, uh, South Zen, and the Zen tradition is more about just watching this. Um, not that there aren't some Zen uh, teachings that talk about koan practice where you're going into some kind of a logical uh, cul-de-sac where you can't get out of it unless you break loose of the chains of your logical mind. And it's meant to do that. Uh, I would say that I got enough chains already. We don't have to create a bunch of other things. Every, everything in your life is a is a, uh, a koan. If you take it that way, it's like rather than figuring something out, when you run into a dead end of some kind, use that as a, uh, the other images as, as a Dharma gate. Use it as, as something that you could actually work on yourself. You could actually look at without jumping to, crawling to, leaping to a conclusion, without doing anything with it. You don't really need to conclude much. The less that you conclude, the more you'll understand and the worse you'll feel. Thank you for indulging me. <clears throat> So uh, Shikantaza, and again, I want to emphasize, I'm not, I'm not saying right and wrong. I say, if you want to do uh, Satipatthana, please do it. Uh, if you're a student of mine, you probably should talk to me first before you do that practice. And, and I won't stop you. I've had other students actually practice uh, a closed eye meditation. I'm not against it. I'm just saying, let's look at this because I, th I think, I feel my understanding is that every person is going to need to do this in a different way, depending on how their particular style, their karma, the causes and conditions that arise as, you know, when you were three years old, when you were eight years old, uh, three lifetimes ago, however you want to characterize it. Uh, the, the way we appear is we're all human, I think, looks like it. Uh, but, but there's so much difference. There's just so much difference. Even, even, even siblings in a family, you know, there's so much difference. So it almost is telling you that um, things are different. <laughs> so that should be appreciated. When I say receive, appreciation, I mean receive, not do anything with it. Just just let things be what they are, if you can. Shikantaza also is a, is a form of... Uh, uh, Satipatthana or mindfulness. <laughs> Pardon me. The difference is, as I see it, is that when you sit down and hold very still, sit in a symmetrical posture and face something that is where not much is happening, the best thing is a wall. You could face the carpeting, you could face a tree or a trunk of a tree. And just observe when you do that, then the eye consciousness is engaged. Uh, not, not much entertainment happening, but the eye consciousness is engaged in you know, a dimension. You know the, the, the dimension of here, here your eyes are, your eye, your uh, seeing organs, and there is the bark of a tree, or there is a, a textured uh, cottage cheese wall, and uh, just observe. And when the sound, sounds come up, just observe. 
when thoughts come, just observe. Everything gets uh, equal appreciation and uh, uh, we are welcoming to whatever is arising in any of the six sense fields without doing anything extra. Now that extra may happen too, because one thing that might arise is a thought about something that happened that was very negative three hours ago or 30 years ago, whatever it may be, some kind of memory. And that you could also appreciate that, let that arise and fall away, just like uh, clouds floating by. But, it, but if you can't, if spontaneously you start to churn that up and reach in and twist it and make it go this way and that way or trying to push it down or fluff it up or ignore it, then just observe that movement. If you can, if you can do that, and this is what mind training is about, if you can do that, then we get to know ourselves a lot better. We get, we get to know, we might need to get rid of something, uh, but we may be more clear about how that negativity arises, especially one like anger. Uh, we may eventually by not, not, uh, um, not manipulating anything, but just watching it as long as you can. I'm not saying there isn't a time when you couldn't go, come in and go snip, but there needs to be a tremendous amount of discipline to be able to do that without all kinds of uh, uh, shrapnel or whatever pieces flying off of that and staying in the consciousness. Just a metaphor. I'm fairly visual, so I talk that way. So don't do anything unless you have to. And if you have to meditate, you'll know it. If you don't have to meditate, do something else. I'm not here to convince you of anything. Uh, on the other hand, if you're open to it, I have a few things to say. So in some sense, shikantaza and satipatthana or mindfulness, uh, stabilization and mindfulness are not all that separate. But what I, the reason I emphasize shikantaza rather than some kind of a apparent controlling thing like you need to focus on this and you need to focus on that and you need to you need to you need to you need to uh, I think we get wrapped up in, in a in a uh, trying to feel like we're more mindful and we, we uh, ego is uh, very subtle and very sneaky and is looking for some kind of conclusion some kind of a credential that yes our meditation is valuable and we're getting somewhere I'm not saying you might not have some kind of uh, you know, things happen that uh, make you feel like you're less uh, warlike or you're more relaxed or, but also it could go the other way. You could feel if you've been covering up a lot for the last 30 years, 20 years, 10 years, uh, that might start to those, all those tarpaulins and all those garbage can lids might start flying off and you might have to see a lot of uh, snakes and weasels and have nothing against snakes or weasels. <laughs> So it's interesting that for each person sitting down and practicing shikantaza, that a different kind of event, a meditation event is going to occur over and over for some people and maybe only once for someone else and three weeks from now from someone else. And even those events, even though they may be similar are not exactly the same because the attendant causes and conditions, uh, the, uh, the, the dependent origination of everything to think of anything happening is dependent on so many different things. So it's very, very complicated. It is not about controlling or getting uh, some kind of understanding of those, although some of that is necessary. It is important to see, simply put, the space in which that occurs. That takes some time because everything feels so personal. You notice it feels so personal. We're all about ourselves. Me, 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 and my stuff, my ideas, my feelings, what I should do, what I shouldn't do, my successes, my failures. Chatter, 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 chatter. Do not get rid of that. In some traditions, specifically, uh, not, not all of them, but some of the mindfulness awareness practices or uh, uh, shini and laktang is the Tibetan, or, or the Tibetan words. Uh, some of those are, are about getting rid of something or controlling something or getting less and less of this and more and more peaceful and more, more and more less uh, attached to things. Um, I think maybe everybody has to go through a little bit of that, but at some point you just have to see that that's a, a circular and anything you get rid of is coming back. And anytime you set, you get better than everybody else around you, it's kind of a problem for communication. People can sense that, that you think you're better than them. Have you noticed that? That's a rhetorical question. Have you noticed that? 
Still rhetorical. Okay, good. <clears throat> so what I would like, so what I'd like to suggest is that when you do this practice, this as, as I'm teaching it, and as it's been taught for centuries, when you do this practice of sit down, hold still, and, and just observe, that you, speaking to any person, might start practicing something very similar to Satipatthana or, or a, a mindfulness, a traditional mindfulness practice. I, I, I recommend, suggest that you keep your eyes, keep all the senses open, including the eyes. But you may just because of your own dynamic that's happening, because you're beginning to, for lack of a better word, trust what's happening, trust that you're seeing what's happening. You may close your eyes. You may begin to uh, follow your breath, which is uh, recommended in uh, even even trunk room uh, recommend or suggested following your breath after the after you've been here about five years and saw that people needed more help than he was giving them. Uh, instead of just sit there, you can follow your breath. And I would say, if you need to do that, then you'll know if you're things are really chaotic, you're having difficulty, uh, you might want to follow your breath for um, you know, three or three or four uh, cycles of 10 or 10 minutes or 15 minutes, or maybe for several days, you might want to do that. It'd be up to you. I, I don't particularly recommend that, but I wouldn't stop someone. If, I've had people come to me and say, this is happening, that's happening. I've changed their meditation based on what I'm seeing. So it's situational it is so situational that when i hear someone say uh or proclaim this is the only way you can do it the only way you can attain enlightenment is to uh, practice buddhist tantra i think that's a little misleading i'm not saying that buddhist tantra wouldn't be an incredible practice to do but it is highly circular the reason that the only way you can step out of the circle is do it so damn much that everything just falls apart and if you practice Tantra, you will you will do it a lot. Isn't that correct, Robert? Loving your teacher. So he's always objecting to me. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. So there again, I think it's about my understanding is it's about, and it's because the way I was trained and the way I came into this uh, many years ago, having two different teachers, started out, out in Zen and then meeting uh, Trunk Rinpoche, practicing uh, tantric practices, which I highly recommend if you're magnetized to do that. I will help you with that. I'll either send you packing somewhere else or I'll, or I'll do it here. I don't have permission, so if you need a, a transmitted uh, or a, uh, a lineage llama, then you might have to go to Nepal, or New York City. Michael. You talked about how if we're getting rid of something, it's circular. And you also said that uh, there might be a time where you just snip whatever it mm -hmm. is, but it takes a lot of discipline. Yes. What is that discipline? You don't need it to go away. No demands. You don't care if you're, you, you do not, and this is, uh, this you could ask Questions the rest of the hour with, uh, about this, what I'm about to say. You're willing to be miserable from now on. That's a powerful statement. That's a powerful, you're willing, and I'm not saying you will be miserable, but when misery comes or discomfort comes, life is suffering. The first words out of the Buddha's mouth, as far as we know, is this is not the Buddha's mouth, but life is suffering. <laughs> That's a pretty good one, especially if you do nothing with it, but just receive it, listen to it, and question it. Is life suffering? Doesn't look like it. Looks like sometimes I'm pretty happy. Please look at that. Suffering is, uh, he probably didn't know how else to say it. I, as, as the story goes, he was on the banks of the Ganges and met his old, uh, his homies, I mean, the ones he used to do all this uh, ascetic practice with and they noticed that his light was coming out of his ears or something like that what you been up to not much and that probably was it probably was it i don't think he i don't think he necessarily moved forward i think he had to be asked in order for him to be the buddha it has to be mutual there is no buddha separate from you if you think there is then that's okay.
do that. If we do feel happy, where is the suffering? Just around the corner. Mm. <laughs> I'm familiar. Uh, it's called relative happiness. I'm not saying, but the, but the whole, the whole uh, what is it, the shebang, the whole shebang of happy, sad, happy, sad, happy, sad, happy, sad. That's the thing that's so antagonizing. And this is the ego, the thing the ego mind, the self-centered mind thinks because of its imputation of the nature of this whole situation that it's separate and everything else is separate, then they can actually have happiness and get rid of suffering. Uh, is a misunderstanding. So it will go at it in a way that just emphasizes the, cir the circularity and emphasizes the ignorance of the difficulty. It is not pessimism. It is not nihilism, nor is it eternalism. It's awareness. More about that if you have it. I was just wondering about with the vow to help others, the Bodhisattva vow, and there's so many people that just will never come to Shikantaza. Would there be any point in teaching mindfulness to those that are not willing to practice this? Yeah, I think so. It'd be situational. Yeah, we could, I, we've taught, you and I both have taught uh, children in schools, and that's kind of a mindfulness practice we're teaching children. You know, seventh graders. <laughs> and, and it's amazing when you see the seventh graders that, that some of them are very, very interested in this, but probably only for the rest of the day. And some of them are, look like they're, they don't, you know, don't even know what this is. And then when they hit the 12th grade, they might be back because something will stick there or not. But we're not interested in promoting anything. I am not. And the people that I work with are, you know, we, it's about being very, if you can't, if you're not really respectful to everyone, their confusion or what you perceive as their confusion, you, know, you need to be respectful of it. And that way, if there is a possibility you could help them, then at some point they'll, you will actually be, because you're not busy judging them or laying, what do they call it, trips on them. You'll see that it looks like they are asking for my help. And then that help may show up a, uh, uh, in a way that has nothing to do with uh, the conventional understanding of teaching Buddhism. Um, what is the difference between respecting confusion or your perception of confusion? I think if there's a perception of confusion in in the story, can that ever be? A misunderstanding if you if you think you're perceiving confusion you mean and you're not yeah could be you have to start somewhere so if if, if you if you're doing that out of your thinking process some people are very very smart very very intellectual intellectually adept at handling any kind any set of concepts and if you and there are so many concepts in buddhism that if you can get come into this you can move these ideas around in such a way that you can not only convince yourself, but convince other people that your understanding is more profound and deeper than anyone's. And so you could, there could be something where that situation is happening, where you're perceiving something that is fundamentally not, probably not the case. It has a, lots of, uh, it's like a hidden merry-go-round. It's like, all you see is the first horse. Would you get, when you get on merry-go-rounds, do you get in the horse or do you get on the little seat? Which one do you want? The zebra. I rest my case. <laughs> How do you think the Clydesdale feels? Is this going to continue or is this kind of circular? <laughs> so would there be um, um, some indication to the person who is attempting to perhaps understand someone's confusion that they've misperceived it? That, that the person trying to understand has misperceived the person who's who's trying to meet the confusion as this person. Oh yes, and that's and there, that would be one indication for not doing anything with it because the person might not be confused in the way you think they are. Their way, their the way you're projecting it, they are. There might be a different kind of thing happening there. So until you the person actually reaches towards you and said, 
says, I need some help with this. Can you help me? And then you might have to start out by saying, I don't know. What, how does it look to you? What can I do? What do you mean? You might actually keep putting it back to them so they can clarify rather than you immediately assume that they need to be on suicide watch. Is offering help being the first person to step into like the help situation as an offerer of the help? Is that always based in confusion? Not necessarily. I mean, it could be, but not necessarily. It's really, really difficult to say it's always this way. Anyone doing chicken tiles is always correct. Anyone doing the pasta is always wrong. You know, that, that's just not true. There, um, there are, there are, yeah. As far as I can tell, and not having met them, but I, there are Buddhist uh, masters who are, who are, coming out of the Theravadan tradition that looks like they're awake to me. I don't know; they probably practice some shikantaza. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it doesn't really. It doesn't matter so much. If, we need to have some kind of a path. The Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha are such an important formula. We need to have a teaching person or a person that has some experience. Uh, word for it, uh, uh, for Theravadan is elder, someone who's done this for a while. And so, and then we had, need to have a teaching. So, and that's something we spent a lot of time looking at Buddhist teachings all around. We're getting ready to go into, uh, into a, a really huge labyrinth uh, called the, uh, what's that called? What's that labyrinth called? No one knows what the labyrinth is called? Abhidharma. Who said that? I figured as much. <laughs> yes, it's the Abhidharma, which is, uh, there's two, as far as I know, and I haven't studied it all that much, a little bit, but there's two different kinds of Abhidharma. There are probably 15 different kinds, but, but there are many, 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 many volumes of that. And so I don't want to do that. <laughs> so I'm having a couple of, m of the monks here do that for me, for us. And then they'll, there's one of them right there, but the grimace on his face. <laughs> 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 so, I had a yes. Go ahead. I was just wondering um, when you were talking about Trump uh characterization of the four mindfulness foundations. Mm -hmm. I missed the body one. What was the, the body was body. body you was body. changed the name of the the last three, and as far as I know, uh, it's in the 73 uh, seminary transcripts, which was the first seminary that he taught at Jackson Hole, Wyoming in 1973. So uh, and then I think he taught at 74 or two in that seminary. They use that model. And then it's also in one of the little books that came out at the same time called Garuda. Um, so and it's a it's just a way that he was uh, teaching it. He saw that as uh, being a valuable or a yeah, valuable way of, of uh, helping because he immediately had hundreds and hundreds of students all wanting teaching. And he started out by, as I recall, that's at least what I got, is just sit there. Just sit there. That was the instruction. Later on, it was follow the breath. Later on, it was follow the breath, follow the out breath, and just uh, disown the breath that's kind of, you know, kind of set up a structure in your mind where you just, and then if thoughts arise, then label thinking back to the out breath, which I practice all the time. Um, so I just, I felt, I think that's all right to do that if you wanted to, if you feel really unstable and want to stabilize, you could do that. But I feel that's much more helpful and personalizes the practice. So you're not just getting, trying to be somebody else. You're not, you're, you're actually, if you sit still, the body is genuine. The mind is full of it. But the body is genuine. So let's hold the body still. Mindfulness of the body, I would say, if I were going to change this, which I'm not, I mean, I'm going to teach this, but I would say the first foundation is body, the second foundation is body, the third foundation is body, and the fourth foundation is body. <laughs> Any body object to that? <laughs> so, and I'm not saying that you, when you go and sit, you could hear that and go and sit and say, you know, I, I just, I think I feel that one of these other ones would be a better, if I were going to use this, one of these other ones would be more workable for me. We would talk about it and I wouldn't try to make you do something else. Okay, Michael. Suffering, is it ever possible to really know suffering? Well, we're not talking about pain. 
pain is pain. We know that the sense feels or can be uh, obstructed or abraded. Um, but I, I think I think it's possible. I'm not making any claims, but I'm just saying I think it's it's possible to understand that in a, in a deep way where there's no one who is suffering. There's just suffering. Um, Anna Maria from Brooklyn, New York has a question. Yes. She asks, it seems there is an emphasis on suffering in life is suffering. Do we need to emphasize something to get underneath slash through ignoring it? What is the tantric approach here? Well, the tantric approach, which I'm not teaching that, but uh, particularly with the tantric approach, there's different ways of of uh, transmuting uh, negative energy, so you don't get rid of the energy. So it's, a, it's very similar uh, and, and has some echoes or some resonances or some calibration or whatever you want to call it with uh, Zen practice, with all Buddhist practices. So it's not, uh, the, the claim is made that uh, you can attain enlightenment in one lifetime and so on. And I'm not disputing that. I'm, they should go on and teach that way. They've been doing it for centuries. Uh, but I, I think there might be ways of, you know, there's practices uh, that, that work with negativity in a more in a more direct way, a more direct yet symbolic, but direct in the symbolism. They're direct with that. So they're, they don't allow a lot of going somewhere else. You get to work with the energy itself. And uh, um, I'm not against that, but I'm, I'm not particularly uh, teaching in that way. So the way I'm teaching, I, I only have a few students couple dozen maybe and that's the way I, t I teach to each to each individual I get to talk to all of my students uh, a lot of times especially at Trunk Rinpoche I had thousands of students he had a lot of students he never even met it's very hard to meet him unless you met him really early, early on so I would say in the Anna Marie in your case uh, I would say just all you have to do is look at the negativity look don't try to transform things it just creates a, an identity called the transformer, uh, which is another way of working with it, which is actually done tantric practice. You actually become the deity. You actually become that. And it takes a lot of work to do that. And I'm not saying that couldn't be what relative term is successful, maybe in some way, but um, it just looks different after having practiced a little bit of that. Yes. Jane from California has two questions. What is the importance of the teacher knowing where the student is at? It's very important. If you can't, if the teaching person hasn't looked at themselves and has doesn't have some understanding of what this is, then they they will look at the student as somebody else, some other and some that has to be modified or changed or lifted up or pushed down or made to do this, made to do that. Some of that needs to mind. The second question, why is it important for the student to show the teacher where they are at? They probably can't do that uh, intentionally, but, but they can't help but do that by just showing up. Anytime they show up there, actually, it's interesting that uh, you may think you're hiding out from others, but everybody can see where you're at. Everybody, everybody can see you. you because you're behind your imputation, your ideas about yourself. But when all, someone else, even if they're, uh, even if they have their own considerations about hiding out or being, uh, having a lot of pride or having, a lot, you know, people are, people are tuned in to other people. They can see your, your, uh, your confusion. They can see your pride. They can see your anger. They can see that. And I like the way I like to say this is, uh, if they're, if they're your friend, then you have so much, uh, other things in common that they kind of overlook your difficulties. They give you a break. They don't point out and say, you know, you're really an idiot, but I love you, but you're just full of it. And it just doesn't seem to work for it. So you just don't, the friend just won't pay any attention. Let's go have a beer. You know, there, there's, it's a relative kind of structure, whereas the teaching uh, person, the teaching and teacher-student situation is quite a bit different. Not that the teacher is going to deliberately hurt you or even point out, necessarily point out. Depends on who you are. Is it 
sounds like everyone else has a vantage point to an aspect that we might be shutting down on. So how can we receive some of that clarity that people have about our confusion? We don't bother. Don't bother. Just work on yourself. No, work on your work on your mind, and then insofar as you can, just relationship. Just be, be good to be nice to people. Be relate to people. Meet them where they're at. Don't correct anybody unless they cut lumber to the wrong length. <laughs> then you can say something about it, like you're behind the next plank. <laughs> So a little bit of that, a little bit of that, but be, be careful, but have respect, like I said earlier, you really respect people's confusion. And if they're around you, then, then they slowly will drop their guard, which they might not even know they're doing about their confusion and will be more open. You actually could have a friendship with someone that, that conventionally in your past life, you would not have been a friend with because they're not comfortable to be around. Some people are very uncomfortable to be around. That's why you need a spiritual friend. It was not, not their friendship is not based on what you do or what you don't do. <coughs> Question from Sokaran in North Rapids. Mm -hmm. What is the object of awareness in Shikantaza? How is that different from the mindfulness techniques spoken about in the Satipatthana? Very good question. Uh, it, it, the similarity is you're, you have objects of mind. The difference is uh, in Satipatthana, you're trying to get to a certain kind of state of mind by controlling or getting focus in certain areas and trying to look at the nature of things and trying to, you're trying to deliberately uh, objectify it so you can see it. So there's a feeling of being kind of above the issue or you're getting rid of the issue. So there's more of a, and I'm saying with everyone, uh, but there's a tendency to be more materialistic about getting accomplished or feeling better. Uh, as uh, Trunk Rinpoche once said, uh, um, um, peace, becoming at peace. It's not about pleasure. It's just about simplicity. It's not about somebody who feels good. I'm, I'm so at rest. I just feel so wonderful. But I practice uh, uh, Satipatthana or mindfulness. And then uh, Shikantaza is also about objects of meditation, but they're your personal objects. So they're your difficulty is coming. You're watching your set. You're not trying to get to some kind of state away from your uh, uh, pile of manure, uh, which is, which is a, just a different approach. It's not wrong. Just a different way of working with that. Uh, and chicken taza, you're, if you're ready for it, then the, the manure is available, as you all know, the difficult areas of your mind and, and so on. And you can actually sit down, hold still and make that your object until there's Transformation at the basis of consciousness is a conventional way that the, the uh, yoga charans talk about. It, Michael, is there a difference between trying to understand suffering and just looking at it? Yeah, I, th I think trying to understand suffering is actually uh, avoidance. Just look at it. Just look at the side. Just receive. No productions. And uh, the thing with trying to understand something is you'll you'll give it a you'll give it a little bit of room to come forward. You're a little bit on giving it your attention, just receiving. But then as soon as you start to get any glimmer of anything, the ego mind says, "Yeah, this is how this works." Next thing you know, you're thinking of publishing a book. This is how you uh, end suffering. Signed, Michael. <laughs> Go ahead. Then is there a difference between experiencing suffering and looking at it? So you know, we're experiencing, let's see, experiencing that and then looking at that. And so I think there are differences, but I think the nuances are, I, I don't know how helpful it would to go in and split hairs on that. Uh, less is better. So you could use either one of those words, but the one that's just the less, you don't, as far as receiving, as I often say, give everything your attention, everything your attention. And if you're, if you're, if you're not receiving, then you're probably producing. And if you're producing, you're covering up the very thing that's trying to get in the door to show you your world. Don't miss your life. Don't miss your world. Yes, sir. A uh, question on uh, your thoughts on uh, sleeping dreams versus daydreams or just dreams in general. Just give me a direct question. I, okay, sorry. Um, sorry. Dreams in general. 
My thought, I don't do thoughts on anything. Okay. Well, that's fine. Um, but, but ask me a direct question. Anything you want to ask, I'd be happy to respond. Um, perception of dreams. Okay. What, what's the question about? Is there a way to um, meditate properly to understand dreams? Yeah. I think the, and I don't want to say best way, what do I know? I'm not, yeah. You know, but I would say, think I, if somebody, if the topic of dreams comes up for, for, for anyone, rather than jump to some kind of th uh, conclusion about it, I would put it back on you and I would say, spend a year writing down your dreams so that you get to know how dreams manifest with your, with your uh, deep consciousness when you're in the intermediate state. When you're dreaming, you're in the intermediate state. It's a very similar state to when, you're, uh, when the body mind has gone away. It's just that the body stereo is still here, so you come back. Simple. That okay with you guys? Okay. <laughs> so write them down. Date March twenty fourth, twenty nineteen. I had dreams last night. I don't remember them. That's it. The next night, March twentieth, had dreams last night. One of them was about uh, running hand in hand with a baboon uh, across uh, the water. We were walking on the water. Both of us were wearing uh, clown costumes. You ever had that dream? No, I've had dreams where it's stuff from stuff or people that I've never met or heard yeah. from and learn stuff. And then next yeah. day, Google it and I'm like, crap, learn something. Yeah. And don't understand how to pursue like how to, my mind gets that. So you don't, you don't have to, a conventional understanding of that, it brings it out of the realm in which it occurs in, which is the intermediate state, and brings it into the relative world where it doesn't work here. Because mm -hmm. there's no time and space there. There's no time in dreams. There's no space in dreams. I mean, anything can be, anything can happen. Anything can be created. The mind is incredibly uh, profuse at generating anything, any spark of this, that, and you cannot find the causes and conditions that cause any given situation. Even though people try to interpret dreams and say, well, this dream means that, this dream, so that's like, you might as well put a bag over your head. If you're going to interpret dreams. Did you hear me? Yeah. What did I say? There's no way of interpreting dreams. Pretty good. <laughs> But you could experiment. I think to do it for six months or a year might give you a better feeling of what your dreaming life is like. Thanks for the question. Donovan. Is the practice of Shikantaza a different experience with beginner's mind as opposed to an advanced practitioner? So I have no way of knowing, but there's probably all kinds of variables happening there. Eventually, it comes down to some form of, of seeing, probably, some form of either seeing emptiness or continually to make up thoughts about emptiness, which means you're still in the in the very refined area of the intellectual mind, which is not wrong. It's just it's not the deep understanding. The deep understanding is you won't find anything. You won't find uh, absence. You won't find you won't find that there isn't anything there. It's a different it's a different understanding, where it seems like that's probably the only word that will, as far as we know, that will work to describe the empty of what you think thought it was. It's still there, but it's empty of what you thought it was. And one of the things it's empty of is it's empty of being separate. Couldn't I say the concept of beginner's mind is an advanced practice? Yeah, as long as it's a beginner's mind. Why is it? Only a beginner's mind. Because I said so. <laughs> I, and I, I don't know. We can go in and chop that up, and you know, you know, if you, if you dice it too much, eventually everything just comes apart, and we don't we don't know what to talk about. So I, I'm not that that's not there's something wrong with that. It's just that I, I can't give a, a response to that that would be really particularly clear. Maybe ask somebody that's smarter than I am. Like. <laughs> have a few minutes yes a couple of questions from greg in the uk yes who or what is it that snips the fuel lines it just snips itself there isn't anyone there anymore maybe it may get snipped and make it you know, that may happen, it may not, but you're, you're not going to care one way or another. 
there isn't anyone in there to care. It's not that there isn't an incredible uh, awareness there about or with everything that's there, but there's no there's no wish for something else. You don't want something else. Wanting something else, second noble truth, is the cause of suffering as was laid out by the Buddha 2,500 years ago. And the third one is, of course, just since I'm mentioning the first two, the third one is, uh, that can come to an end. Niroda is a Sanskrit word, I think. And then uh, Marga, or the fourth one, is the, the path, which means Shila Samadhi and Prajna, or discipline, sit down, uh, Samadhi, look at it. And what's the last one? Prajna. Prajna. Or Pranya. Pranya? <laughs> Where's Bhaskar when I need him? Pranya, and, uh, which is uh, wisdom, or seeing that there, there isn't anything but this. Nothing separate. More? Second question. Can mundane worldly concerns be reconciled with Dharma? And how do we work with spiritual bypassing? Who's asking that? Great, from the UK. I've heard this spiritual bypassing thing uh, before. Someone accused me of spiritual bypassing. And I thought, I thought I'd hidden that well. <laughs> <laughs> you taught me. So here I am bypassing. Um, if, uh, if he wants to talk to me about that, since he's asking that kind of a question, now I'll go back to the first one in a second. But he should talk to me face to face so I can see what he means, because that's a really loaded concept that is all over the internet. Not that I look, not that I look at the internet. <laughs> what was the first part of the question? Can mundane worldly concerns be reconciled with Dharma? And how do we, oh, just that. Okay, if you, if you understand uh, who this is, I mean yourself, not something I tell you, not, not something a Buddha told you, but if you understand what, what this is and thereby understand what that is or subject object, put it scientifically, uh, you see that then everything is included. Everything is, uh, I don't know if I'd use the word reconciled because that, in, that involves something that's not reconciled, which involves going from this to that. You don't go from this to that. You never leave this room. If you think you leave this room, that's just indicative of your misunderstanding of who you are, what this is. Uh, time and space are an illusion. The, the quickest access that is still a concept of that is this moment. This moment has no dimensions. The second has dimensions, but you can't find the front and the back of a moment. And there isn't anything but this moment to use that kind of a statement. Is your guy? In post meditation, should we endeavor to be mindful? No. Should there be any practice after meditating to try to see more clearly? I think if you're doing enough sitting down, holding still, and just watching the movement of the mind, then when you get up, your particular dynamic that's happening through that practice, will uh, different things will show up differently. Um, um, vacuuming the carpet or... Uh, Shopping at Sears. Of course, there's no Sears left, so you can't shop there. But, you know, do, interacting with your family or your friends or the Sangha, you know, uh, insofar as you can, the only practice that I recommend is to listen to people, listen to what they're saying, and listen to not only the, the words, but also the tone of their voice, the color of their clothes, their, their body posture, and so on. Receive everything. Just this world is incredible, incredible for, uh, even though it's flooded with suffering. And it's very difficult. Uh, you could start by not adding to the conflict. This doesn't mean go with the flow. That's horseshit. You don't have to go with anything. You don't have to agree with anything. Just stop obstructing things with your opinions, ideas, judgments, valida uh, validations, invalidations. So don't do anything with it. Just receive. More? Thank you very much. Donovan, you have one other question? Uh, in regards to Nishika's question Go ahead. and your responses. Um, so ultimately, you initially said no to not endeavor to do anything differently off the cushion. But then you continue to say to receive. What's the difference between receiving and endeavoring to receive? <laughs> you need a spanking. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> I think it's, you know, we're, we're trying to do that. So there's some kind of efforting happening there a little bit. Or just kind of noticing that you could actually listen to someone, what someone is saying without, without contradicting or coming up with a, a lot of ideas about that or engaging in an argument or disagreeing. And just so when some when you're doing that, what happens if you do that uh, thoroughly, di- completely and directly, you'll also notice that all of the maybe unexamined things that are coming up uh, or get sparked or triggered those things that are happening when you start to when you begin not doing anything with what's happening, what's coming towards you, then that then uh, uh, some aspect of a deeper consciousness, Aliyavijnana, those things start coming forth and they can be things that you you've been able to shut out just by disagreeing with what's in front of you you disagree with the trigger and then that kind of modifies the thing so that everything is triggering you uh, instead of seeing that as a dharma gate this can help me because it, this person is triggering deep you know conventional term of neurosis stuff stuff that's been hidden that we, we need to work with that in some way is that is that helpful or have i missed your point of your question no it'll do all right. <laughs> okay, one more from Ed, and then we'll stop. How do you reconcile something that's continually changing? I'm not interested in reconciling anything. Yeah, rephrase your question. I had a rephrasing, but let's see. I can't think of it right now. How can you make sense out of something if it continually changes? I'm not, I don't care if you make sense. Everything continually changes. That's enough. You don't have to do anything else. That's one of the, that's one of the uh, three marks of existence, impermanence. So you, once you start to see everything changes, forget about that. Now let's work on uh, suffering and uh, no self. You got, you got the first one. Okay. Thank All you. right. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> Thanks, Ed. And thank you, everybody. We'll stand and dedicate the merit in the back of our chant books. I'd like to remind everybody that tomorrow night, uh, Sokazan will get, be giving a talk in Kalamazoo at Sanctuary Yoga at 6 o'clock. And then also on Tuesday night, he'll be in Grand Rapids at Unadorned Lotus, also giving a talk. So please join us if you can. And don't forget about our donation boxes and our friendship drive for this month. Thank you. May the mirror of this penetrate into all places so that we and every sentient being together can realize the Buddha's way. Ten directions, the three worlds, all Buddhas, all venerable ones, Bodhisattvas, Mahasattvas, the great Prajna, Paramita. O oh, Buddhas and Bodhisattvas of the ten directions and the three times, please hear us. Please come down out of the light, protect Soka Koji Buddhist Temple Monastery. Our Sangha, families, friends, and visitors. Feel everyone who is unhappy, sick, or suffering and fill them with life.